I wanted to very briefly revisit this demo from last class. Uh, as you may have noticed during last class, I was showing you this is now um, the extra fun stuff from a few classes ago that I was doing last class, but something went a little bit awry in my demo, uh, which is that I claimed that while logistic regression didn't maximize the margin, SVM does maximize the margin for a linearly separable data set. And I played around with the regularization, and everything stayed the same. And then I played around with the regularization some more. And then weird things started to happen. Um, and I just sort of brushed it off. So I just want to quickly talk about this. Essentially, what's happening here is that under normal circumstances, when you don't have a huge amount of regularization, um, I'm highlighting the support vectors here in yellow. So there's just two support vectors, one of each class in this case. And when the regularization is not too large and you have support vectors looking like that, then yes, the boundary maxes, maximizes the margin. What happens is as you increase regularization, you're making the, the weights, the W, smaller. Remember, that's what regularization does. And I'm just going to scroll up to this diagram. So you can see the hinge loss here in orange. And points that are not support vectors are in the flat part over here, So let, meaning you're getting something very right. But if I really crank up the regularization, I'm going to make the weights, the W, smaller, which means I'm going to make, I'm basically shrinking this x-axis here. And I can get a correctly classified point that was formerly not a support vector to become a support vector. Um, because I can get it, the W, small enough that that correctly classified point is lying in the, between this 0 and 1, um, which is like saying my, my this loss is not 0, even though the data set is linearly separable. So in, in terms of hinge loss, you're thinking, well, if it's separable, I can get a hinge loss of 0, which is true. You can get that. And you will get that for a range of regularization strengths. But if you really crank up the regularization so much that eventually the weights are getting pushed so small, then I'm going to scroll back down now. You get back into this type of situation over here, where it's no longer maximizing the margin clearly. And what's happening is um, we're getting correctly classified examples into that. Um, so we might be able to find an intermediate, slightly less crazy one. There we go. I don't know. Oops. Let's see. So here we're not maximizing the margin. The, the boundary is a bit shifted from the center, for example. And I was confused when I was going through this last time. And things become more clear when you plot the support vectors, because then you can see, well, those things shouldn't really be support vectors if the thing is linearly separable. So I don't have a super satisfying intuition, but at least there's a technical reason for why this is happening. And we'll talk a little more about regularization today as well if we have time. OK. Um, we are going to start um, with a, not exactly a digression, because we haven't really started yet, but um, a self-contained thing, which is that we've been talking about least squares linear regression for quite a long time now in the course. We've always had these normal equations, which are here on the slide. We've seen that over and over and over again. Um, this is the case where you have L2 regularization. So in the bonus slides, and you can take a look at this if you're interested, there's another way of reshuffling um, the normal equations to get something that through a bunch of identities, you can get to this. Um, and the key point here is that you're dealing with an n by n linear system instead of a d by d linear system. And this is good news if n is much less than d. So usually, we talk about n being more than d. So, uh, certainly, in all our two-dimensional plots, we have more than two points. But I would say a more typical situation is n 
being greater than d, but also that, that might not always be the case. Um, I haven't worked in genomics, but I think I heard somebody mention that this happens a lot there as an example. So since we're now solving an n by n linear system instead of a d by d, the running time, um, while n cubed normally seems more painful to us than d cubed, here it's actually better. So um, we need to keep this in mind because it's going to be a major player in today's lecture on the kernel trick. Okay, so this matrix that showed up in that other normal equations has a name, the Gram matrix, XX transpose. And if we think about what it means, well, here's a picture of X with the training examples in the rows. There's a picture of X transpose with the training examples in the columns. What happens when I multiply those things? I'm actually getting dot products between training examples and other training examples. So for example, the first element is x1 dot product with itself, and so on and so forth. So we saw something similar to this when we talked about RBF features a while back, um, in that we had this symmetrical pairwise um, matrix. But here, it's, but with, with RBF features, we were taking the distance between, or uh, the Gaussian function of, of the distance. So our, our similarity metric between training examples there was based on distance. And here, it's based on dot product. So, this other normal equations and then the intuition that the matrix that shows up in this other normal equations are just a bunch of dot products is going to be a key point in the stuff we're going to do today. Okay. So, I hope you can see the yellow. I guess maybe it wasn't that great of a choice of color. Can people actually see? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so, I have, again, just synthesized this data set. There's nothing particularly meaningful about it. But I've synthesized it intentionally so that it is not linearly separable. And what we're going to be doing today with the kernel trick is we're going to turn linear methods into nonlinear methods, and we're going to do it in a way that is computationally nice relating to this other normal equation stuff. And the intuition behind what we're going to be doing today is this. Here we have these two features, x1 and x2. Our problem is not linearly separable. And I could try to fit a linear SVM to it. I guess in this case, it's just predicting blue everywhere. Um, it's not getting perfect training accuracy. But let's say we transform the features in a particular way, which is we make a new feature, Z1, which is equal to x1 squared. And we make a new feature, Z2, which is equal to x2 squared. In that case, when I look at the data set in our new feature space, Z1, Z2 space, it actually, the shape is different because we did this, this nonlinear transformation with our features. Um, and if I fit an SVM to this, then I can get zero training error. So this isn't that talking, I guess, in the sense that we talked earlier about changing your feature space or your basis or whatever you want to call it and how that can be uh, a good idea and we could fit polynomials with linear regression, all that kind of stuff. We've just revisited that now with classification. Again, there's this issue of how do I know which features to pick. Obviously, I showed you this very contrived situation where once I 
pick the squaring feature, then everything was perfect. And in fact, I generated the data so that that would happen, right? But by the end of today, we can get to methods that should be able to figure, the, figure this out on its own in sort of a reasonable way. So punchline here being transforming my features can, and then fitting a linear classifier can make a data set that's not linearly separable into a data set that's linearly separable. And what I should have done and will try to remember to do for next class is sh showed you a, one final picture, which is what does this boundary look like if I untransformed it back into the original space, and it would be some sort of ellipse thing. I'm going to scroll up. It would be some sort of ellipse thing probably that's red over here and blue everywhere else because when x squared is small, then it's predicting red, and when x squared is big, it's predicting um, blue, so it, it's something that's predicting red near the origin and blue elsewhere. And this is not to say that our goal is always to get zero training error. We know that's, that's not necessarily our goal, but our goal is to make more complex models out of our machinery that fit simple models, in this case, linear. So it's somewhat analogous to when we talked about change of basis with regression. Questions about this? Oliver? Uh, so the reason why uh, if we go back to the original space that it, um, it will create an ellipse mm -hmm. kind of region is it's because like in calculus the, the, uh, the equation of an ellipse is like in the form of like x squared y squared. Yeah, Oliver is asking why is this an ellipse? So um, this boundary here in the transform space, well, our boundary is always w transpose x equals 0, right? So, well, in this case, z. So in this case, it's w1, z1, plus w2, z2, or maybe with an intercept or something like that. But this is actually x1 squared, and this is actually x2 squared. So playing around with the two coefficients, w1, w2, you should should be looking at ellipses. Don't remember your name. Cheyenne. Cheyenne? Yeah. So why does this happen? Like, why does like squaring it and uh, make this like? Linear? Yeah. Why does it work? So it works because I picked the data set intentionally so that it would work, right? But remember when we talked about nonlinear regression, I said, look at this. I use. Uh, a, a quadratic fit, a cubic fit, a quartic fit, and maybe one of them was the perfect fit, and then the bigger polynomial just went crazy, right? But then back when we talked about regression, we had a couple of tools of dealing with that problem, even if we didn't know what the perfect basis was. <coughs> Number one was regularization. We said, let's let it do crazy things, but regularize it so it kind of picks the useful bases automatically based on the data. And the other one was this RBF thing that said, it, it's kind of this weird non-parametric basis that should learn some reasonable squiggles through our points uh, if we use regularization properly. So we're going to be doing something relatively analogous today. It's just that we'll have this additional kernel trick aspect to it, which is purely computational, that will make things run really fast. By the way, um, one thing that will become apparent shortly is I transformed from a two-dimensional space to a two-dimensional space, but you don't have to do that, right? Um, you can transform from some number of dimensions to some other number of dimensions, and we will be seeing that shortly. OK. So here's something we talked about a while ago this polynomial basis issue. And then the, I kept sweeping something under the rug. So if this was bothering you until now, here we go. I, I kept only talking about one feature, starting with one feature, d equals 1. And we, we talked about 
So with RBF, we didn't have that problem back in regression because you were just taking distances between points. If those points were d-dimensional, that was fine. But when we talked about polynomials, we didn't. I didn't want to get into that. Um, and let's get into that now, and you'll see what the problem is. So let's say we had two dimensions and we wanted to do a degree two polynomial. We have our bias column. We have our linear term columns. We have our quadratic term columns. But then we also have this interaction term column, which is if we want to consider all degree two polynomials using x and y, or x1 and x2, or whatever you want to call them, I have 1x, y, x squared, y squared, and xy, right? And that's the full um, degree two polynomial. So the reason why this is going to get messy, and I was avoiding it earlier, is it's not just that I separately, for each feature, take all the polynomials, but there's also these interaction terms between features, and there's going to be a lot of those, and that is problematic. So I'm not going to crazy numbers here, just four and three, okay? Not a million. Just four features and three polynomials. So we have our constant term, our four linear terms, and then we have the each thing by itself, right? X squared, Y squared, Z squared, cubed. And then things start to go downhill because we have all the degree two interactions and then we have all the degree three interactions. So whatever this function is, and I'll, I'll talk about that in the next slide, we're going to get a lot of features here, right? This is not looking good if I had 1,000 features and degree five polynomial, then um, what actually happens is that the, the relationship is around d to the power of p. Ish. Um, and there's a bonus slide that says what the exact number is, and it's a bit less than d to the power of p, um, but some ridiculous number, right? So if I had 1,000 features and wanted degree 5 polynomial, then I'm talking about 1,000 to the power of 5 or 10 to the power of 15, which is not a matrix I'm going to be storing. I mean, that's pretty much game over, right? That's not going to fit in memory for even one training example. So this is why I was avoiding the issue before and today with the kernel trick. We are going to play some computational mathematical algebraic games to make this thing not hopeless. That's really the goal today. And then if we make it not hopeless, we can apply it not only to regression but also to classification. We can apply it to both and we can start doing some interesting things with uh, SVM. Any questions or comments about this? So the mindset I'm hoping you have right now is I'm awake. I remember talking about this a few weeks ago. I remember that we avoided this issue of doing it for more than one feature. That was kind of unsettling, but I forgot about it. And then bringing back this issue, it's definitely unsettling because there are a lot of these polynomials, and let's find out how to deal with it. OK, so here's what the kernel trick is all about. This other normal equations thing, as I, as I showed it to you, it only depended on these dot products between training examples. And let's say x is the size of an x vector is d. d is the number of features. That's the size of an x vector. The size of a z vector. We're calling that k. That's the size of our number of features after transforming. So the whole problem we've been describing here is that k is getting to be huge. And so even a single d vector might be too big to even store one of those vectors. The whole way this kernel trick is going to work is it's, well, actually, we don't need the z vectors themselves. We just need dot products between them. And if we can do some weird math 
to just directly get the dot product without ever storing the vectors themselves in the process, then we can get over this computational hurdle. So that's the overall strategy. Connor. So is the reason we don't want to go through the original process just to just because of space? It's not time. Well, space and time are related. I mean, if I have a vector of length 10 to the 15, even if I could store it, I wanted to take the dot product with another such vector, that would be 10 to the 15 operations. So those are both problems. OK. So the way we normally make predictions, it, uh, or how we were doing it before, we would transform our x into some z, where again, the, the tilde, the squiggly thing on top, uh, means it's a test, uh, test data. And then we were renaming w to v uh, when we were transforming features. But that's basically just w. And we were getting. Um, we're getting V like this using this other normal equations. So actually the entire Y, when we actually want to predict on test data, it's Z test times our learned coefficients. And I'll just stick that all into one place. So I have I've substituted in for the learned coefficients, weights, whatever you want to call them, parameters. I've just substituted in the formula for how we get them. <coughs> and then we see something interesting here, which is that actually it's not only do we just need these dot products to get <coughs> v, but we actually only need these dot products to make predictions. Because conveniently, we had a z, and then we sort of stuck another z right next to it, and now they're right next to each other. And that's just more dot products. So in fact, if we can take these dot products between vectors, either in the case of k training vector with training vector, or in the case of k tilde test vector with training vector, if we can take these dot products, we can just directly make predictions without ever even storing v. And remember, storing v was just was part of the problem, right? Because if k was 10 to the 15, if that's how many features we had, then even we would need that many coefficients. That's how linear models work. We have one weight per feature. But now we just say, I'm not even going to ever get into my hands at any particular time the weight vector. I'm just going to go directly from training data all the way through to predictions using this formula. And now you should start to be convinced that if I can do this dot product thing somehow, I haven't told you how yet, but if I can do this dot product thing without ever forming those giant vectors, then I can just make predictions and everything's OK. Forget your name. Gareth. Um, Gareth. When we decide not to store this, do we end up doing more computation over the course of all of the predictions than if you had just stored this? Um, yeah, so, in, so Gareth is asking about the total amount of computation we have to do. Um, I would have to think about that a little bit. It probably depends on what are all these numbers like n, k, d, et cetera. Um, the goal is to do vastly less for values of those parameters that we care about, like k being huge in particular. And it, yeah, so if, if you look at the size of these matrices, um, there is no k appearing anywhere. So it's like, can we do the computation in speed independent of k? Well, we will, we will try. I mean, remember, those matrices, those k matrices have in them dot products, which are dot products between vectors of that length. But if we can directly get those dot products, then we can do it. Okay. Right. 
OK, so I, I think I've pretty much said all of these things, except that I need to introduce the word kernel function. So the kernel function is this thing that is shocking that it actually exists. But here is what it is. It's a function that takes in two vectors, x1 and x2, or i, j, x1, x2, whatever. Uh, it takes in two vectors. and the, the slow way of doing it would be transform this one into the new feature space, transform that one into the new feature space, and take the dot product. But this function is supposed to somehow get me that answer directly without computing, the, creating those giant vectors. And you might not believe me that this is possible. I still have to convince you. And it is possible for certain feature transformations, including common ones like polynomials. And then we're going to get this big speed up. Uh-oh. OK. Um, so imagine we have two training examples, and we're in d equals 2. So each training example is a vector of length 2. And the feature transformation we want to do is this. We want to take a training example with two values in it and transform it into a space of three dimensions, k equals 3, that has the first thing squared, the second thing squared, and the first thing times the second thing. And we don't really need to care about this square root 2. Um, that's just a scaling which we're putting in to make it all work, but it doesn't really affect things. OK. Well, what is the dot product of z1 and z2 had I formed those two vectors? Well, it's written for you on the slide. It is the sum of three terms, because a dot product is these things multiplied together plus these things multiplied together plus these things multiplied together for vectors of length 3. And when we crank through the algebra, in this case using the completing the square trick, we see that you can actually get this thing by just taking x, the two x vectors, dot producting them, and squaring it. So Here's the first indication that this is not completely ridiculous. I mean, right now k is 3. That's not that big. You can create vectors of size 3 and take their dot products, and that's gonna, not going to melt down your laptop. But still, it's interesting that we just directly did this op operation on the x vectors. We dot producted them and squared it. And it is algebraically the same as had I done this other thing, which is create the, the vectors in the new feature space and taking the dot product there. So this is a sign that it might be possible, at least for this very particular case. That's interesting. I mean, it's not like, oh, of course, at least to me. It's, it's, it's interesting that there are transformations for which we can do this. Any questions about this, especially about kind of big picture stuff? Like, why do I care about this type of question? Oliver? Uh, why would the inner product be considered a measure of similarity? Why would the inner product be considered a measure, measure of similarity? OK, so we don't really need that for, to, to proceed with everything we're about to say. but. Um, essentially, an, an inner product has to do with how parallel two vectors are. So if this is one vector, that's another one. Their inner product is 0. If they're very similar, if the angle between them is small, then their inner product is larger. So something like that. I mean, the, the normalized inner product is literally the angle between them, which is definitely something to do with similarity. OK. so. We can do this with k equals 6, so that we can have the full-on degree 2 polynomial with all the terms, constant, linear, linear, quadratic, quadratic, and interacting quadratic. And the details of the algebra here, well, they're hopefully correct, but they're not really the main point. Um, so I'm claiming that if I just take 1 plus x transpose x squared, then I get the right thing. Um, 
again, I mean, this is the type of thing you can review later, and we, we don't really have time to go through it. But if I do 1 plus, then I'm actually getting all the lower order terms. So again, this is equivalent to the dot product in six dimensional space now. OK, so in general, this is the main thing. If I just take for degree p polynomials, the kernel function is for two vectors, I take the dot product of them, add 1, then take this to the power of p. That's good, very good, because taking something to the power of p is not a big deal. Taking the dot product in d dimensions is not a big deal. So instead of doing something of size d to the p, which is like unthinkable, I'm just doing something of size d. I'm just taking a dot product between two d dimensional <laughs> vectors. And somehow, it can give me exactly the same result. And because this other form of the normal equations only depends on dot products, and I now have direct access to all those dot products without forming all those vectors, I can do linear regression using weird polynomial bases with lots of features and all the interaction terms in reasonable amounts of time, more or less. I mean, there are some disadvantages to doing things this way, like um, it's this sort of non-parametricness that I don't get to distill my stuff down to my coefficients, throw everything away, and do my prediction later. I have to do that whole big one shot of prediction. Uh, and I can maybe only, I can pre-compute k, but I cannot pre-compute k tilde because that involves the test examples, which I don't know. And so therefore, I got to keep the training examples around. So I've given what is a parametric model, like a non-parametric, the properties of something that's non-parametric, which is a little weird. OK. Right. This is a very dense lecture. For me personally, this is something that took a while to get the hang of. Um, I think my best strategy is probably to just keep going so that we have more chance for the demos, which are maybe a good use of time. OK, just comparing linear regression as we knew it to kernel regression, which is this new thing we're talking about. Before, we formed z using whatever feature transformation we wanted. We just did the good old normal equations. Um, that backslash is a typo. That should not be there, sorry. Um, z transpose z plus lambda i inverse times z transpose y. Um, and then when we wanted to test, we took our test examples, did the same transformation to them. That gave us z tilde. And then we computed the predictions. Now we're doing something different. Um, OK, we got to be a little bit careful here. Um, no, OK, that's fine. OK, so we can pre-compute some stuff still. Um, but we cannot pre-compute everything because when we're testing, when we're making predictions, we still need to take this kernel function of our test examples with our training examples because we required the dot product between our test examples and our training examples. Again, the backslash. Oh, well. OK, so 
A very popular kernel is our friend, the Gaussian RBF. This time, Gaussian RBF kernel, before we had RBF features. They are similar, but not actually the same thing. And this is a little weird, maybe. But normally, the way I've been pitching this to you is here's the basis I want. And how do I kernelize it? What's this magical function that given two x vectors gives me the dot product in the kernel space? But here I'm starting with the kernel function. I'm saying, hey, why don't you use this kernel function? People like to use it. And you're thinking the opposite question. OK, what feature transformation does this thing actually correspond to? Well, it turns out it's an infinite dimensional feature space. So. Since this whole thing is supposed to be independent of k anyways, meaning the size of our feature space, sure, why not? Let's use an infinite dimensional feature space. We never have to form those vectors anyways. Certainly wouldn't want to now. But you can show that this Gaussian RBF kernel function, if you ask yourself what feature space did this correspond to, some infinite dimensional thing, which kind of makes me think this is going to be a very powerful, and by powerful I mean there's a lot of complexity available to us here, which was definitely true for RBF features as well. And we're going to need to be careful with our regularization and all that kind of stuff to not go overboard. OK. Um, you can use the kernel tricks on data types that are not just numbers. So if you want to predict something given an image, or given a string of words, or given a piece of music, or social network graph, or whatever. Um, like with KNN, when we said, if I can define distances between these things, I can use KNN on them. If I can define kernels um, and good ways of computing them between all of these different data types, then I can actually use them. Um, I can perform regression or classification on them. So if you come up with some function given two pieces of music that says some sort of similarity thing about them and has some properties, then you're basically good to go. But now not just with K and N, but now also with linear regression or SVM or whatever. OK. Um, yeah, OK. So. This is just saying Euclidean distance is sort of a, a case of this. Um, and as a result, we can do this with our distance-based methods. So we can play this trick. This is one of those lectures where it's like a meta thing. right? It's not a new method like decision trees. It is a meta thing like ensembling that we can apply to all different kinds of classifiers, models, etc. Um, and all of our linear model stuff we can do this with. And remember, logistic regression and SVMs are linear models too, just with different losses that make them useful for classification. So logistic regression and SVM get to be on this list. I'm not saying you necessarily now know how to implement them, but you should be vaguely convinced that this might be possible. OK, here's the thing about why people love to use kernels with SVMs. We still have this dependence on n when we want to make predictions. And if we have a huge data set, this is the normal curse of non-parametric methods. When we want to make predictions, we still have something involving n. But we, want to, we don't like n, right? n could be huge, and we want to train, deal with the hard part, then deploy our system and be fast at making predictions. That's often how you want things to work. The thing about SVMs is that if you play your cards right, instead of depending on n, it depends on the number of support vectors, which is here called m. And you might kind of believe that, because I argued that a 
the non-support vectors don't matter, that you could have just thrown them away, trained your SVM, and gotten the same result. So if they don't matter, it kind of seems intuitive that I could just not keep them around and then not need to use them to make predictions. And therefore, if I have a million points and 10,000 support vectors, now my prediction is 100 times faster, which could easily be the difference between reasonable and not reasonable. So this is one reason why people really care about the support vector aspect of support vector machines, uh, which we couldn't really talk about until today. So for example, with scikit-learn, which I'm not saying scikit-learn is the machine learning package, but it's certainly a popular one. Um, just as an example, here kernels are there for support vector machines. And in fact, RBF is the default. And that's why I kept having to say kernel equals linear when I was trying to show you linear SVMs. With logistic regression, while such a thing exists, kernel logistic regression is not right there for you to use. OK. Let's see what we can cover here. OK, here's some, some data. Um, I want to talk about these hyperparameters. So in scikit-learn, I think they're a little backwards sometimes. So in scikit-learn, the notation is different from our notation. This hyperparameter called gamma, we would call it 1 over sigma, which sigma being the width of the, the Gaussian, which we had from before. And what they call c, we call 1 over lambda. So here's what these boundaries look like. This is an example. And then what we want to know often is, let's build some intuition for how the hyperparameters affect what's going on here. So this is gamma equals 10, c equals 10. Now I'm changing to gamma equals 1, c equals 1. And I get this, I guess, simpler looking uh, shape. And so what I've done here is I have made gamma smaller, meaning I made sigma bigger. So why don't I keep um, sorry to do all this scrolling. Why don't I keep this C constant? So the only thing we change is gamma. OK, so here was our smaller length scale, smaller sigma situation. I had these little kind of islands of classification. And when I made gamma equals 1, I somehow got smoother. And again, it's, it's a bit hard to describe. And now let's say I use a lot less regularization, so I make C a lot bigger. Now things sort of get more complicated again. So I personally find it a bit tricky to understand exactly what the role is. I find gamma relatively intuitive. Like if my sigma is really small, then I allow big fluctuations. That's what we saw in regression. So with classification, it means I allow red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. Whereas with uh, sigma really big, I'm only allowing some bunch of red and then some bunch of blue. Uh, the regularization is a little bit weirder. But it is true that when I decreased it, I got what I would call a slightly weirder looking surface with these more islands, which is kind of what we generally expect when there's less regularization. OK, so I don't, I don't know if this is or isn't the first. It's one of the first times where we have an algorithm with more than one hyperparameter. And we've talked briefly about hyperparameter search. And I've said to you guys, you cannot just select one hyperparameter at a time. That's why hyperparameter search is so complicated. They interact with each other. So I made this picture. I try a range of gamma values from 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the plus 3, a range of C values from 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the plus 3, train the SVM every time. And I made this picture of training error for you. I had 10 values of gamma that I tried, 10 values of C that I tried, and the color is the training error. And we can see the top right is the lowest error, which makes sense, because this is less regularization to the right, 
and smaller length scale going up. So yeah, I'm going to have lower training error. That's like the direction of making things crazier, right? No regularization, do whatever you want, squiggly things, fair game, right? <coughs> so we get low, low training error there. Um, but then if we look at the validation error, it's more complicated and the two hyperparameters kind of interact with each other in the sense that if I were to fix one of the hyperparameters and optimize the other one and then optimize the other one or something like that, I don't necessarily get this, the, the optimal result which requires looking at the whole grid. And this isn't even a particularly crazy problem. This is just two hyperparameters. I only tried 10 values. It's two-dimensional data set. Um, but just start thinking about this. This is important, right? Think about how hyperparameters interact with each other. I think that will serve you well. Any questions about this picture, by the way? Like, if you could have predicted just by thinking that the training error picture looked the way it did and this looked the way it did, that's a kind of advanced application of the skills you've learned in that, that course, and I, I'm happy to see that. And of course, you can't figure out exactly what it's going to look like, but you're going to kind of know, I don't want to go all the way over there because that's overfitting and that kind of thing. OK, um, yeah, there's so much more to say. And maybe we can do it next time. Um, or we can at least take a quick look. Let's take a quick look. OK, I wanted to show you some interesting pictures. So for example, I, I wanted to dig into this issue of what is regularization actually doing for these RBF SVMs. Um, so here's a classification boundary. And here's this underlying W transpose x-like thing. It's not really W transpose x anymore because it's doing it with the kernel way of doing things. But scikit-learn still exposes it to me. It's the thing before it got thresholded, even if we don't exactly have a name for this. Um, and what I just wanted to show you is that if I add more regularization, meaning I make c smaller, then I can dis make one of these islands disappear. So I'm going to scroll up. I had these different islands of red. And then I scroll back down. And I'm only keeping one island. So I somehow regularized the thing more, and it didn't feel like it was any more worth its while to make those islands of red. It rather just let the regularization force it to not do that anymore. Because um, that's kind of what regularization does. But I admit it's not like the most intuitive thing in the world. But I still wanted to show you this picture, which is interesting, at least to me, because it says those things up there are support vectors. They matter. So in the kind of pre-thresholded form, there's still stuff happening, right? <coughs> it's just, but regularization kind of made those um, islands less big so that the thresholded version, which was the hard decision boundary, didn't kind of make it. You could think of it as like an island is, is called an island if it's actually tall enough to be above the level of the water. And you still have this island up there, but it's just not quite tall enough. So when you threshold the thing, you don't actually see it in your classification boundary. So regularization is doing stuff, but it's not super obvious to me anymore when things are getting this weird, like, oh, I'm going to change the regularization. And of course, the boundary is going to change like this. It's getting to be a bit of a mess. Um, OK, so to summarize what we talked about today, we talked about how using complicated bases or feature transformation can get us interesting boundaries. I, I didn't say this, but of course what I meant to say, or maybe not of course, what I should have said is notice those things weren't linear anymore, right? That was the whole point of, of, of all of this. We got nonlinear boundaries out of SVMs, um, and so we could learn more complicated decision surfaces. The kernel trick just takes advantage of some algebraic and mathematical conveniences and allows us to do this in a way that's actually efficient. Um, and I, you can apply this to a lot of methods. So I guess we will stop there and I'll see you on Wednesday.